Okay. Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about painting. So last time we talked about drawing, so this is a very similar kind of thing. We're talking about painting as a big picture in general, but looking at the different kinds of materials and different kinds of techniques that go into painting. So just kind of learning about painting in general and uh, some more of the things about it. So first of all, let's start really basic. What is paint? Paint uh, is pigment. So you're going to he hear me say the word pigment kind of a lot today. So pigment is the powdered color, which historically has been made from naturally occurring minerals. Like if you look in some historic uh, blue paints used in Egypt, ancient Egypt, for example, they were made with um, pulverized lapis lazuli. That's a, a gemstone. So um, they're made out of, out of that as the pigment. So paint is literally a, a pigment, a powdered color that's then compounded with a medium or a vehicle. Um, and in this case, what we mean by medium or vehicle is a liquid that's going to hold those particles of pigment together without dissolving them. So it's kind of the carrier for the color, for the pigment. The vehicle generally acts as or includes what's called a binder. And a binder is an ingredient that um, sticks everything together, that adheres uh, the paint to the surface that you're working on. So you might recognize the word binder. It came up last time uh, in drawing when we were talking about pastels. I talked about how one of the ing ingredients to, to roll them into sticks to hold them together was a binder. So that's what paint is. It's pigment, it's a vehicle that's liquid, and it's a binder that holds everything together. And those are the three main components of paint. There are lots of different kinds of paint, and we're going to talk about a lot of them today. So there's encaustic, fresco, uh, tempera, oil, watercolor, gouache, and acrylic. So first, we're going to talk about encaustics. Um, encaustics is a kind of painting that's very, very old. It's been around since uh, ancient Egyptian times, and uh, it's something that not that many people do anymore, but luckily here at OTC on campus, we have kind of an expert in encaustics. If any of you have had classes with Kat Alley, who's our wonderful chair of Fine Arts and Humanities, Kat is a painter and she does encaustic painting. So it's kind of cool because it's an unusual thing that not as many people do anymore. And right here in our own department, we have someone who does encaustic painting. Um, so what does encaustic mean? It comes from the Greek word for burning in. If any of you take Greek, you'll run across the roots of lots of words. I took Greek in college, and it's kind of useful. It's like Latin. A lot of words come from it. Um, and what it is, is it's pigment, so the crushed color pigment, and it's mixed with wax and resin. So in this case, the wax is the vehicle. The wax is what's carrying the pigment. So on the right here, we have an ancient example of encaustic painting. This is a death mask. Um, from ancient Egypt. So this is a painting um, in encaustics on wood that would have been placed over the uh, mummy in the sarcophagus. So this is a portrait of the dead person's face that would have been placed in above her in her uh, coffin, in her sarcophagus. Okay, um, next we're going to talk about fresco. Fresco might sound sort of familiar to you if you've heard of, of this before, especially if you've taken art history. Um, so here are some of the tools, like in drawing, I like to start with images of the kinds of tools that are used for the types of painting that we do talk about. So um, in fresco, pigments are mixed with water and they're applied to a plaster support, usually a wall or a ceiling coated in plaster. Um, and plaster, though, the thing that is usually most readily familiar to people when I try to explain what plaster is, is if you've ever broken your arm or leg or something and you have a cast, the stuff that makes the bandages hard and, and stick onto you, that white powdery stuff that's mixed with water, that's plaster. Okay, so there's, um, if you live in an older house, your walls might be plaster. At my house is 100 years old, so our, our walls are mostly plaster or plasterboard. Um, so it's something that's still used in construction and it's still used in the medical industry, um, but it is also an important ingredient when you're doing fresco painting. So when we're talking about fresco, there are two different kinds. So there's fresco secco, uh, which is Italian for dry fresco. Secco means dry. Um, and in that case, it's exactly what it sounds like. The plaster is completely dry. The wall is all finished and dry before you start painting on it. And then there's buon fresco, which means true or good fresco. And uh, in this case, it means the plaster is wet. So the difference between these is in fresco secco, 
basically um, it's like doing a mural on a wall. So you're painting on a wall that already is dry and you're just painting a mural on the surface. In Buono Fresco, um, the plaster is wet so it literally mixes with the paint. So the paint becomes part of the surface of the wall. It's really bound into the wall. So it's a little bit more permanent and it's more integrated. So uh, this example below is um, a mural that's at the Vatican in the Papal Chambers. It's called Philosophy or the School of Athens and it is by a painter called Raphael. Pretty famous guy, has a ninja turtle named after him. And it is a buon fresco. So it was painted with the wet plaster so that's kind of part of the wall. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to talk about tempera. Tempera is also um, becoming kind of a lost art. It's not something that you see people doing a whole lot anymore. It's sometimes also called egg tempera um, because the binder in this case is an actual egg. It's the, it's the yolk from an egg is used as the binder. Uh, so tempera, it's an aqueous medium, meaning it's a water-based medium, like, uh, like watercolor kind of. Um, technically, Tempera is paint in which the vehicle is an emulsion. So an aqueous liquid, which is mixed with a fat, is how you get an emulsion. And in this case, the fat is the egg yolk. So the egg yolk holds everything suspended in the water. So it, it makes it, um, the egg is the binder that's holding the particles suspended in the water and also helps bind them to the surface. Um, egg tempera is super, super fickle. Um, it's beautiful. It was used in the um, Middle Ages a lot, in, in medieval times a lot, to make those beautiful, vibrant um, icons with the gold leaf of the, the holy figures, usually the Virgin Mary and saints and things like that. Um, it was used uh, on wood a lot in the Middle Ages. It was still used in the uh, early Renaissance and, and some painters even up through the Baroque used it. If you take art history with me, we will talk about uh, egg tempera as, as the prominent and most dominant painting medium in Europe for, for many hundreds of years. Um, and you could get really brilliant, brilliant color. The emulsion really brought out the, the richness of the pigment. Um, but the problem with it is, is you couldn't get as much depth, okay? So it would kind of, if you put it on very thick at all, it would crack and flake off. So you had to do very thin, very light little strokes. So it was a little bit tricky and you couldn't get that nice um, texture that you get with oil paints, that impasto texture. So that's what tempera is. It's another um, kind of paint that is not used very often anymore, uh, partially because people don't like to carry around eggs with them when they're going to paint, I guess. Uh, I saw a demonstration of egg tempera um, at the Springfield Art Museum um, done by uh, the former department head at Missouri State University, uh, Carolyn, um, Oh my gosh, Cardenas, Carolyn Cardenas. Uh, she's, I don't think at Missouri State anymore, but she uh, is a temper painter. And so she did a demonstration of it. It was very interesting to watch. It's not something I personally have done myself, but it's, it's an interesting technique uh, that has a very rich history. Okay, next we're gonna talk about oil painting. So um, a lot of classically trained painters are, uh, use oil. Some use oil and acrylic. I use oil paint. I also use acrylic paint. Um, and so in this image, you can see you have your palette, you have all your different little uh, tubes of pigment, and then you have the different kinds of oil here below. So you can use poppy oil, you can use linseed oil, you can use uh, safflower oil. There's lots of different kinds of oils that you can use to dilute and to work with your paint. Um, you also use mineral spirits um, and, and or turpentine with the paint to um, remove it and to clean the brushes. So it's, it's quite toxic actually. So if you get into oil paint, make sure you're in a really well ventilated area and make sure you don't touch it a whole lot with your fingers because uh, that's basically drinking it into your body. And um, some of the things you use with it like mineral spirits and turpentine can cause um, nervous system damage. So just be really careful as someone who worked with oil paints sort of unsafely for a long time because I didn't really know what I was talking about. Just be careful, um, but it, it's beautiful. You get really great uh, depth um, and, and you can get really fantastic color when you're working with it. So uh, oil paints consist of pigment compounded with oil. Different kinds of oils are used with it. 
Historically, the oils used are linseed, poppy seed, and walnut oils. Today, linseed and walnut are still used, but safflower oil is also used, and safflower is probably the most common. I use linseed oil when I paint, um, but lots of people use safflower. Um, I don't know anyone who uses poppy anymore, um, but there are people, especially in the Ozarks, who use walnut oil because you can get locally pressed walnut oil, which is kind of cool. Um, one of the great things about oil is the way that you apply it when you're painting um, is what's called glazing. So you do thin layers or glazes and then you layer them on top of each other so you can get this really rich depth. So you can get this kind of almost glowy sort of color. Um, and then the other nice thing about it is you can use it in a bunch of different ways. So unlike tempera, you can paint with it very thickly. So if you've ever seen like a Vincent Van Gogh painting, uh, in, in person, um, it's really textured. There's a really heavy texture that's called impasto is the name of that kind of texturing. And you can do that with oil and really build it up on top of itself and it won't crack. Um, it also takes an extremely long time to dry, which is one of the things, one of the reasons painters like it because you can manipulate it for so long after putting it down. Whereas acrylic and watercolor dry very quickly. Um, so oil is pretty fantastic. It becomes popular in the early Renaissance and is first popular with the uh, Northern Renaissance painters like Jean van Eyck, um, which again, if you take art history, you'll learn all about that. Um, next, we'll talk about watercolor. So watercolor is the medium that most students are familiar with because it tends to be something that you do um, in elementary and high school. You tend to, to, if you do painting, you tend to do watercolor painting and acrylic painting. So you may, um, this might look sort of familiar, these little cakes of, of watercolor. Um, you can also get it in um, powdered form. You can also get it in little tubes like what you see in the lower uh, left and then mix it with water. Um, so watercolor consists of pigment and the vehicle is just water with a little bit of uh, gum arabic in it, which helps it um, stick to the paper basically. Uh, so gum arabic is a sticky plant substance that acts as a binder. It's in a lot of art supplies. It's kind of been used historically and is still used today. Um, so watercolor dries very quickly um, and you can manipulate it in a lot of different ways. Um, if you go to Watercolor USA at the Springfield Art Museum, I highly recommend it. It's an annual show and it's really incredible to see the breath, the different kinds of uh, looks people can achieve with watercolor. You can get something that looks kind of like this, which is a little bit more loose and expressive, but pe people can do very controlled, very detailed kinds of work with it. Uh, and then this is acrylic paint. So I'd say most of you are probably somewhat familiar with acrylic paint. This is, there's, oh no, this isn't acrylic. I'm sorry. I'm looking at my slides out of order. This is gouache. So this is very closely related to watercolor. They're very, very similar. Um, but it generally comes in tubes. You can also get it in cakes, but it's almost always in tubes like this. So this is watercolor that has inert white pigment added. So basically, um, it's the same kind of idea. It's an aqueous medium like watercolor, but it just has white in it. So it's not as translucent. It's more opaque, essentially. So inert pigment is pigment that becomes colorless or virtually colorless in paint. But what it does is it makes it... Um, more opaque, less translucent. So with watercolor, you can see through the layers um, more than with gouache, but you can use it in different ways where you can you can put it on fairly thinly or uh, make it thicker. So it, it's a very versatile aqueous media as well. Here's acrylic. Okay, so uh, acrylic is, I, I use acrylic and oil. I actually use them together with one another, which some a lot of people don't do. Um, Acrylic, uh, there's lots of different kinds of acrylic paints on the market. Golden and Liquitex are my favorites, but you can use all different kinds. I like the heavy body golden and Liquitex paints. You can use a lot of different kinds of brushes with it. With oil paint, you tend to use a natural fiber brush, like a badger fur brush. Um, with acrylic, you want to use a synthetic brush, usually. Um, and uh, let's talk about a little bit. Oh, here's an image of a glass palette. That's what I use uh, for acrylic and usually oil. I just use a piece of glass like that. So acrylic is, is the newest of the kinds of paint that we talk about today. So by the 1930s, 
chemists had learned to make strong weatherproof industrial paints using a vehicle of synthetic plastic resins. So acrylic is made out of plastic, basically. It's made out of, it's a petroleum-based substance. Um, and these new synthetic paints are broadly known as acrylics, although a more exact name for them is polymer paints, which you might see um, them described as occasionally. The vehicle consists of acrylic resin, polymerized through emulsion in water. So how temperate is an emulsion of water and fat? These are an emulsion of water and um, plastic, basically. So uh, acrylic is pretty great because it will kind of do whatever you want. You can add different mediums to it. To um, You can add like a retardant, which makes it dry very, very slow. So it acts more like oil paint. You can use it in very, very thin with lots of water. So it looks more like watercolor. Um, you can get it to do kind of whatever you want. A lot of people who don't, who's, who kind of stick to more traditional media than acrylic, think it doesn't quite have the depth of color that, say, oil does. Um, you can get some pretty fantastic depth of color with acrylic, though. You just have to learn how to use it. This is a painting by local painter Christy Snelson, um, who uses pretty much just acrylic, I think. I don't think she uses oil very much. She occasionally does encaustics, um, but you can see that there's some pretty rich color here. Um, so it's a great uh, medium to use because it's very versatile. You can use it in a lot of different ways. Okay, and then the last thing I want to touch on, I just call painting off the wall. So um, this is just to say that this isn't the exhaustive list of kinds of paint. You can paint with kind of any, any liquid material. You know, you can use non-paint. On the left here, we have uh, Linda Bangless painting with poured uh, latex paint, house paint. Uh, on the right, we have an installation by Katarina Gross, who's a contemporary German painter. She's one of my favorite painters. And she does these huge large scale installation where she's just um, spraying the powdered pigment out over everything. So she's not actually using a vehicle most of the time. And so she's using paint. It's paint, but it's also an installation. It's also um, sculptural. So there's lots of different ways to think about painting um, that don't fit neatly into any of these boxes. So I just like to bring that up. A lot of my work, I do uh, more traditional paintings on canvases, but I also work on um, clear acetate. So I do uh, sculptural installations where I'm doing oil paintings on clear large sheets of acetate, and then I drape them over copper tubing and cords um, spread out through a gallery. So there's just a lot of different things that you can do with paint that don't necessarily fit into what we always think about paint. So I just like to end there with this painting off the wall to give you kind of a wider idea of, of some of the things that can be done with paint, because it's sort of limitless. You can do a lot of different kinds of things with it. So that's a really brief kind of introduction to paint, and I look forward to seeing what you all do with your painting exercises. All right.